is the My Amazon Guy podcast, and we will be going live in 10 minutes.
We've hit the halfway mark. We'll be going live in five minutes. In just 60 short seconds, we will be live to answer any and all Amazon questions your heart has ever desired the answer to.
Hey, happy Friday. Welcome back to the States, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I finally made it. Hopefully everyone had a amazing holiday, an amazing new year. It's the first Friday of 2024. We're ready to hit the ground running here on our yes, QA. Are. How are you today, Faith? I'm doing well. Uh, first Friday of the year so far, so good. I'm feeling better uh, from the Vegas Rona. So <laughs> we are good to go. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So uh, we don't have a lot of questions today. Uh, actually, just the one comment here. Amazon Marketplace, wonderful marketplace. I don't know if I agree with that all the time. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it can be. <laughs> Appreciate your optimism, uh, Sedona. <laughs> and then Siam says, hi. Hi, Siam. What's up? Happy Friday. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy Friday. Happy New Year indeed. Yeah. Um, so do you have any New Year's resolutions, Tom? You know, I have been asked that question a few times. I think <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest thing is I just want to get back into like a, a good workout routine. I used to be That's like a big one. gym rat, gym nut, and mm -hmm. I haven't gone in like a year and a half, two years. So I'm Starting to get a little flabby here on the yeah. arms and in the tummy, and uh, it's time for a change. And it's always uh, good on you know the start of a new year to to push something like that through. Yeah, uh, that's other true. than that, I want to read more books. Something I've never been too caught up on or done too much, but I got a nice little backlog on my Kindle. Okay, I was gonna say I have a few recommendations for you depending on uh, your favorite genre, but I'm in a Stephen King grind right now. I'm going through the stand. Uh, and I just went through Oh, that. that's classic. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. What about you? New Year's resolutions as we're letting the questions kind of flow, flow through right now. Uh, DoorDash was. <laughs> <laughs> DoorDash less and um, pay off some credit card. Not that I'm in debt or anything, you know, just you know, pay off just a little bit or whatever. So I, uh, I can respect the DoorDash less because my wife got a notification on her phone over the weekend. And it's like, oh, if you signed up for our premium plan, you would have saved $150 for the month of December. And I'm like, oh, shoot, we use this thing way too much. We need to Listen, <laughs> my, my DoorDash app has given me stats. Um, last year, <laughs> so here's my DoorDash wrap. Last year, I ordered a Baja Blast 52 times. That's at least <laughs> once a week. <laughs> Just the Baja Blast. Well, I mean, I guess with like other stuff, but like specifically that item, it says you ordered this 52 times oh, in the uh, last year. <laughs> I, I'm bad about a good uh, McDonald's breakfast. I, I like Oh, it. God. Yeah, no, that's even classic. Even today, I started out with uh, a coffee order and a... Uh, Good sausage, egg, and cheese McMuffin to start my. Oh, day. that's a good day. Not not going too well with the uh, <laughs> the the New Year's resolution of working out more and getting in better shape, but we'll hey, get there. You know, it's only the fifth day of the year. It's only the first Friday of the year. You've got time. Got time. And but... DoorDash Fridays are a legitimate holiday. <laughs> so I respect that. Yeah, yeah. Also, DoorDash this morning had a Baja Blast. Taco Bell breakfast is pretty good if you guys haven't had it. So, um, I have awesome. None. All right. Yeah, we got some Happy New Year's here. Gregor says Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Gregor. Good to have Nathan, you back. Nathan, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Nathan. Sandy Flo, I like that. Happy New Year. And then Siam says Happy New Year plus Happy Friday. Yes. So we've got a lot to be happy about today, guys. I think, <laughs> I think that that calls for... Um, the gestures, if it'll do it. Yay! <laughs> do the, the rock on one. Okay, give it a second. I always feel like a boomer when I do these, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. We'll dive in here. Then if we run out of questions, there are a couple of pieces of Amazon news. Nothing too crazy. Just a couple of new features with brand tailored promotions and subscribe and save. I could honestly probably recap it in like two minutes, but we'll, we'll wait. We'll get into the questions. So awesome. Start out here with Blaine Dares, one of our members. Happy New Year, Faith and Thomas. With over $500 daily ad spend, does Amazon charge your card multiple times a day or increase your credit limit first? Good question. 
I'm uh, kind of blanking on that off the top of my head. I know it's not. If, I'm not sure they're going to Let raise me go it. to the. I'm not going to show my screen just, you know, so we don't show Steven's payments. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the payment reporting on um, the advertising console and see when those payments are coming out. So give me a second. A little bit of a boomer. I'm I'm looking at that right now. And again, like you said, not like we can screen share. Um, maybe you can open a case and ask for a higher credit limit, but I'm seeing daily charges for amount billed at about five hundred dollars. So, Blaine, I think you're exactly right. You're gonna get that charge every single day when you hit that five hundred dollar yeah um, limit, and it looks like that's just reoccurring and, and happening nonstop. Now, depending on your payment settings where you can have that taken from a credit card, or obviously you could have that taken directly from an Amazon account. And that's where something like, which a lot of sellers kind of, I don't want to say get into trouble with, but it's, it's never a fun thing seeing that account level reserve yeah. number, right? I mean, sometimes we'll see is a little separate than the specific ads payments, but what comes into play here is like Amazon has to keep that account level reserve at a pretty high rate, sometimes higher. Yeah. Sometimes it's a really high percent or a really high dollar amount in sales um, or revenue coming through that they keep on the account so they can pay thing like pay things like ads and any other charges um, that accrue uh, on the account, assuming you're having money taken away from the account specifically and not a credit card. Yep. Yeah, and then um, <laughs> while Tom was explaining that, I also pulled it up on my end to confirm that, yeah, it does look like it tops out around 500 daily. So, <sighs> stinks, but I, yeah. I, I, I think don't know if you can change that. That's the only thing I'm trying to think yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. so best case, no pun intended, is to file a case with Amazon and see if we can get that increased. But, yeah, good question to start out with. Thank you so much, Blaine. And then follow-up question, Thomas, a couple of months ago, you talked about the Amazon affiliate program you were testing. Any updates? I would assume this would be Creator Connections. Um, before I go into a pretty decent rant on this. He's ready. He's got it cooked. I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't remember if last time I checked, I thought we didn't have access to this or Steven didn't have access to this on, on Age of Sage yet. So you know, I'm in here. So let me check. Yep, something went wrong. Try reloading the page. Yeah, it, it's it's Blaine to to be extremely straightforward with you, which you know we like to always do here. Yeah. It's been pretty hit or miss. I had a couple accounts within my uh, team's management that you know got a couple additional thousand yeah. dollars in sales for the month, and it's it's um, very quick in terms of like depending on what influencer you find within the Creator Connections platform, and if you. Remember, you can do things like find those creators who are partnered with Amazon, those influencers who are partnered with Amazon, and filter them by like the specific niche or the category that you um, are selling. And so maybe you're selling a product within toys and games. You can filter by that and find someone mm -hmm. who promotes that type of content. So you can hopefully get uh, someone who's more affiliated with that type of category and that type of program to help promote your product. So Blaine, it's been pretty hit or miss. Um, a lot of accounts, we've set this up and tried to find a couple influencers and it's kind of been a bust. Uh, yeah. It doesn't mean it's not something worth testing, right? Every product. Absolutely. Yeah. It's worth testing for sure. Yeah. But I agree with Tom with the accounts that I've tried it on. Um, it's hit or miss. Like I've seen success. I wouldn't call it like a resounding success, but you know, when he, income is success right so yeah. i've seen some stuff come through you know in like decent orders too not like one or two but like over 50 but less mm -hmm. than 100 so that's mm -hmm. not the average i've been seeing whenever it does work out exactly yeah something to test playing that's that's how i'd kind of tee it up go go through it test it out draw uh, the one thing i can say to give you a little bit more strategy here is it seems like the higher percentage you set as a commission rate maybe more towards that 15 or 20 percent you could get some uh, um, some better influencers to promote your product, people who have more reach, essentially. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, because and Tom does bring up a good point. It is also going to depend on the influencer and what kind of reach they have. So, yep. Awesome. Got a 
few more member questions here and then we'll go back up to the top. It's kind of a slower day today, so I have no doubts we'll be able to get to everyone's questions. Yeah. All right, Rosina. Hey, Rosina. Happy New Year. Still in the first week of 2024. So happy New Year. Yes, happy New Year. I, um, If you want, let us know your uh, New Year's resolutions. And um, this will be your year, Rosina. Yeah, love it. Yes. In supplements, I have three SKUs. Each is in the same primary category node, health and household, but a different secondary category node for each one. Can I still combine them under one parentage? They're going to have to be under the same category because health and household is very broad. You know, that's going to go across a lot of things, right? Like toiletries, uh, toothbrushes, to tooth, you know, like there's a bunch of stuff that can go under like that main umbrella. Another way to think of this, Rosina, is think of another category, say toys and games. You wouldn't be able to pair it up, say like a card game and like a an action figure. So it's kind of like that if you want to think of it that way. Um, they would all have to be under the same subcategory. Yeah, and I was going to share my screen real quick. And, all right, uh, let me add you to the stage. Let me know when you're ready. Oh, I'm, I'm good to go. Oh, I'm he's good to go. He's cooked. Just, just to show <laughs> kind of everything that can be tucked under health and household here, you're going to have things like household supplies, baby and child care products, personal care, funeral yep. products. That's the first time I've that's a That's a category. <laughs> <laughs> Oral care products, the, the list goes on, right? So Ro Rosina, like what's good to keep in mind here is, is even within these subcategories, sometimes there can be different restrictions, different category level type things, different category specific fields. So exactly like Faith said, um, depending on what your product is, you have to keep them within the, the same subcategory to have that parentage set up correctly. Yeah. Oh, good demonstration there, Tom. I really like the side navigation actual visual because i was trying to explain it and i think i did a good job but it's always good to have the visual so well it's it's kind of weird too because if you go through <laughs> like the manual the manual add a product method and you're in the back end of a listing where you're just manually do it yeah no, no flat file feed and you click that like category tree um where you can search or you can go through the little drop downs that sometimes can be different from what i've seen in the actual like download your category uh, feed from the um, add a product bulk upload, the flat file feed template. So sometimes those those subcategories can get a little confusing and sometimes yeah. <laughs> they mm -hmm. don't even like specifically match the same verbiage between the manual method and between the uh, bulk method with uh, flat file feeds. But you can always kind of just sit there and trust the Amazon customer side that has all those category trees kind of laid out for yeah. you. Yeah, that's what I rely on a lot too, so... Yeah, good question. And then um, another one from Rosina. For the clothing category, considering buyer's traffic is mostly from mobile devices, can you please share the ideal listing image file size ratio for optimum visibility on mobile devices? So what we like to do is we like to do a one by one ratio. So 2000 by 2000, 4000 by 4000, uh, just as long as it's one to one. That usually shows up well, both on mobile and on web. Not only that, but you're able to zoom in, so it's going to help with your image quality. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think that zoom in feature to get enabled has to be a thousand by a thousand. Last time, yeah, I at least a thousand by a thousand. I know our designers like two thousand by two thousand, but as long as it's that one to one ratio in some capacity, it'll it'll look out. Really <laughs> One thing, Rosina, to kind of give you just a little bit of a value add there. Also keep in mind like your image file size. You don't want, especially on mobile, you don't want those images to like take too long to load. So exactly. this is some, sometimes something we have to like catch internally when we're making designs. And when you're making pretty hefty designs and images inside of something like, uh, I don't know, Photoshop or InDesign, whatever those creative mm -hmm. tools are nowadays that people are using, the more you do, and maybe depending on how you output that, sometimes those file sizes for just like one or two images can be massively large. And what that can do is that can tend to slow down how the fast the image loads. Like if someone clicks into your PDP, yeah. and that main image isn't loading quick enough, that could, I mean, sometimes all it takes is a couple seconds before someone just, you know, clicks the back button. I'm one of those people. I'm impatient. Like yeah. I'm going to see it right away. Yeah, exactly. So... Good question. And then last one from Rosina. Side question. Do image file upload sizes affect mobile upload? We literally just went into that. Didn't even mobile see it. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
or does Amazon automatically shrink them for mobile users? Yeah, so we did go into that, but just, just to recap, like it can, like we've seen instances where it's like slowed it down a little bit. Yeah. And as we just mentioned, that is a little conversion factor as well, because people such as myself are a little impatient and they want to like see what they're looking at right away. All right, awesome. One more member question, and then we're going to go back up from the top and read down. So OSIS, <laughs> happy new year, OSIS. How many days uh, do new products stay in the new release? I think it's 30 days, Tom, but please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not quite sure on that one. That, that's for sure what we generally say for yeah. the, what we deem the honeymoon period where Amazon's giving you technically like a little bit of a boost or a fair play yeah. to test out your product with decent page placements and rankings just to see how it converts and assuming you capitalize on that at the fullest effect, getting sales, getting conversions during that honeymoon period that is what's going to solidify your um, um, your kind of like status in, in the rankings and, and help give mm -hmm. you that boost past the honeymoon period. So in regards to, to the new release badge, I would say that follows kind of the the same um, methodology. In my yeah. opinion, maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's three weeks. I'm not sure if there's uh, specifically like a time limit on that, but you'll, you'll definitely have a couple weeks where you'll, you'll keep that new release badge. And, and maybe Faith, maybe it's a little more dependent on the amount of new products coming in that could get that badge as well. Like, I don't know. That's correct. Yeah. And especially in that category too. Yep. But it, Cause it can also be category dependent. I would assume a lot of things are so. S safe bet. I'd say two weeks to a month. You, you'd probably yeah. keep that badge on average. Awesome. And then Rosina says, you guys are mind readers. Yeah. <laughs> Try to be. <laughs> How we got in a mag, we were able to read the minds of the interviewers. <laughs> Try to be, Rosina. Great questions. Thank you. No, you did have really good questions today. And then Osas asks, what's your intake, guys, on the new feature for posting videos on the post section on the brand store? I think it's a fantastic addition, to be quite honest. I'm a big proponent of videos because... Um, and I know this is very simple to say, but just simply showing the product in use is incredible. Um, you know, you get to see the size of the product, the application of the product. It's a really invaluable piece to have there. And I know that the brand store has the capability to add videos anyway, but with the post section, you know, you have a little bit more leeway in terms of like user generated content, stuff like that, just because it's formulated like a social feed, if you will. Yep. Yep. You, you got it. <laughs> Tom's like, I have nothing else to add. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then Brian B had uh, some insight into one of Ros uh, Rosina's questions about your sizing question. I found that, yes, you do need to have over a thousand pixels for zoom in, but we use a landscape ratio to optimize per mobile, but I'm not sure the exact dimensions. Oh, that's really interesting, actually, Brian. I'm, I'd be curious to A-B test that to yeah. see how that would convert. Because I've never considered that. Very nice. All right. Now we're going to scroll back up to the top and kind of go from there. Let me make sure that I don't miss anybody. So if I do miss you, just feel free to leave another comment. Like I said, it's kind of slow today. So unlikely that we'll miss anything. Uh, Siam says, what is Amazon Q4? Uh, that is roughly the period between October, November, December, I think. Three months. You got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So a quarter, you know, like four quarters in the year, you know, each is three months. So that's the period October to December, aka the busiest, most peak season of Amazon. So um that that's that answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, broad question. We could go a yeah. little deeper yeah, here. So, so deep in that. I mean something to keep in mind is like during this time, this is exactly like Faith said, this is when traffic's the highest. This mm -hmm. is also when competition is typically the highest in terms of advertising, in terms of um, trying to get better rankings and places yeah. on uh, the search results on Amazon. So not that it's necessarily strictly a, a, a pay to play time period in general, like ad, uh, Amazon has become heavily pay to play with needing a sufficient ads budget and ad strategy to really succeed and grow your brand and your products on Amazon. But this is when competition's the highest. This is when people are slashing prices to be more competitive, um, working to capitalize and gain as many conversions as possible during this peak time period. The only other thing to say here is that we're saying this pretty generally, like it applies to all of Amazon and, and it kind of can be said that way, but it's something that is category 
dependent, right? Uh, gift giving items, um, electronics, tech products, those typically are going to be the type of products that really see that spike or that peak season when you're looking at something like supplements that can sometimes be that Q1 time, right? New year, right. new me type mentality where, like I said, for my new year's resolution, I want to be getting in better shape, getting back into the gym. I'm probably going to start buying protein and other supplements. And, and I'm doing that in, in Q1 here as I kind of start that. So yes, Amazon Q4 generally is that high peak season, but depending on what you sell, depending on your category, there could be other times that, that your products see that. That's spike. true. That's true. If uh, you sell mother's day gifts, for example, yeah. Probably not your time. <laughs> Lawn and garden, that's going to be heavily in the Oh, yeah, that's a summer. better example. Yeah. There's tons. There's tons of examples. Sports stuff. Yep. You know, like soccer. Yeah, no, great question, Siam. And then, then I did see another member question come through from Brian B. Hey, Brian, always good to see you. Hey, guys, I was wondering if you had any hot tips for the search query performance report. I'm trying, oh, Tom is ready. I'm trying to analyze it, but I can't seem to find key metrics that would help. Don't worry. Tom and I are about to cook you a feast in oh, terms, <laughs> in terms I, of uh, analysis here. Yeah, I already got it. Uh, I already got it pulled up here. Let me share my screen. You know, it's cooked. It's ready to serve. Okay, as Facebook pulls that up, for those who don't know, this is single-handedly the best and most useful report you can get directly from Amazon Seller Central. The search query performance report essentially tells you how customers are interacting, converting, or engaging with your products during each stage of the funnel, whether it be impre impressions, clicks, add to carts, uh, full-on purchases, conversions, etc. You are getting data in regards to the um, search volume, you're getting data in regards to your brand share or your ASIN share for each of your um, products. More specifically, you're going to get, oh, Faith, it looks like we're missing HSH here. Oh, um, let me see if I have it. Not, not that we have to have it that way. And it looks like I was actually in the search catalog performance. Um, but Age of Sage has a lot more data. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So uh, Holstit is one of uh, Stephen Pope's uh, mm -hmm. brands we have on the Age of Sage account. Um, and here you're going to see a, a examples. We sell like, uh, um, like not guns, target stands and whatnot um, for uh, shooting, right? Um, so you're going to see things like holsters, steel silhouette mounts. These are essentially uh, search queries that Amazon has deemed as our like most important ones, depending on the amount of share and the amount of traffic we're getting from these search queries. So what's cool about this compared to something like Helium 10, compared to something like Jungle Scout, is you're getting this straight from the source, straight from mm -hmm. Amazon in terms of monthly search query volume. Um, more importantly, the, the, the biggest metric here is your brand share. How much of the real estate or the market you are taking up when someone searches Glock 19 holster, for example. Yeah. And what's cool about this is you get that brand share through each stage of the funnel. You get this report and can aggregate it or sum it in different ways, whether you're looking at weekly, monthly, or quarterly. This report gets updated on a weekly basis. And Brian, you would be heavily surprised to see how much it could change depending on what you're doing on your account. Um, aside from me taking the whole time on this faith maybe you want to touch on like things you can do to to kind of increase your branch oh, yeah. from yeah. this report right during each stage of the funnel so like what are some things that we do or we kind of teach coach and, and mentor our clients and our our team to, to make an impact and grow your brand share right so um what we do is we kind of take all of the data and put it into a funnel to figure out where we need to hone in and what that would look like in practice is if we just go from that first line Glock 19 holster, we can see that our particular branch share of that is 0.26%. And then whenever we go on down the funnel, we're kind of going up in clicks. Yeah, we're gonna have to zoom in. I know that's a lot of data. Um, and then let's go back here. Yeah, cart ads, we kind of go a little bit further up. And then let's go back purchase rate. Yeah, a little bit. So this is an, an inverted funnel, which means that 
We don't have a lot of visibility, but when we do, we're popping off. So with this information, what we can do is, okay, we need to be more visible for Glock 19 holster. Now, Glock is a brand name, so that's not something that we're going to be able to put into like our backend keywords yep. or anything like that. However, we can advertise that. And, you know, with some very, very well-crafted verbiage like fits or, you know, for, use for Glock 19 holster uh, or holster. Sorry, you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, but yeah, so with some very carefully placed verbiage like that, some more advertising, we can get some more traffic to this, increase our brand share in terms of impressions, which then in turn will kind of further increase funnel going up. So that's just one example of how you can use this data to kind of hone in on what you need to do. Now, there are examples, too, where um, the the reverse will be true, right? Like we have more branch here for impressions. But as we go further on down the funnel uh, with clicks, car ads and purchases, it gets a little lower. So then what that would indicate is there is something with the listing that isn't jiving with the people that they're not wanting to convert on, which means you're going to want to look at some of your CTR elements, such as main image, copy, A plus content, you have video on your listing, et cetera. Yep. No, that that's great. I think the only other layer I want to add here is we always get the question like, well, Tom or, or, or Faith, what's the right amount of brand share I should have? And that's kind of a loaded question. In my oh, opinion, yeah. Because you're going to see a term in here like uh, Holstit, which is our brand name. Well, we sure as hell better have as much brand share as possible. Right, yeah. Stage of the funnel, right? Because this is us. When when people search Holstit, they should be seeing our products. And um, we, we should have most of that market share since it's our brand name. Now, if you're seeing drops here, especially on your brand name, one thing you can do here to heavily counter this, again, specifically honing in on the impression stage of the funnel mm -hmm. is... Um, be more offensive on your uh, branded advertising. So maybe raising your bids on branded terms or branded product terms. Uh, and if you're not doing any branded advertising, self ASIN, self branded advertising, well, you would probably see a lower percentage here as well. Now, when you look at something that could be more top of funnel is how I like to tee it up more broad, essentially mm -hmm. not an extremely long tail keyword. Let's see if we can find Probably um, shooting stand would be a very broad. Yeah, shooting stand. That's probably one of our, yeah. our lowest percentages here, uh, eleven percent. So, on broad terms, uh, really terms that have that higher search volume is typically where you'll see this. There's more competition. There's more people right. competing for it. It's not as applicable to your specific product because it's more top of funnel, and this is where you're going to see lower um, brand share or uh, market share for the impression stage of the funnel. And the biggest way, like Faith mentioned, specifically for impressions, you can manipulate this is advertising. We mine this report weekly, monthly, all the time to find new advertising targets or use the data to measure where we need to push harder on, right? The impression stage of the funnel is most easily manipulated yeah. through ads and the bids Correct. in these keywords because you're paying for that placement to raise your market share. And then when you exactly. see that going up, essentially just, just to wrap this up in a fine bow, what you're looking for here is um, increases through each stage of the funnel, percent increases through each stage of the funnel. And like Faith mentioned, if you're um, seeing drops or seeing low brand share on lower stages of the funnel, like car ads, purchases, that's going to be on your product detail page, essentially meaning yeah. that the search query, whoops, the search query isn't as applicable to the content on your listing. They've clicked through, you, you showed up for Glock 19 uh, holster, but then they get to the listing and maybe that's not actually what they were looking for. Right, yeah, maybe they were just looking for a Glock 17 yeah, holster. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know how, how that worked. I'm not a yeah, I don't, I don't that's, either. That's really. the same methodology you can kind of use to rinse and repeat this. So Brian, mm -hmm. you should look at this report weekly. You should pull it weekly, yep. you can download this. Um, just with this click of the button here and use these uh, these date ranges and these reporting ranges to kind of measure your differences for your top 50 search terms is where I'd stay focused here. Yep. We have no, I love this Dinner has been served. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We have cooked. We have served. And if you want dessert, let us know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next member question, and then we'll go back up to the top. 
All right, Josh Kennedy with a four-parter here. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Josh. Good to see you and happy new year. In our category golf cart wheels, most competitors have main images with the grass and the sky in the background. We also have our images this way. However, recently all of our main pictures for certain listings reverted back to the original white background pictures. Whenever yeah. I try to add the grass sky main images, the picture never displays. When the main image has a white background, the changes I make to the other images in the lineup stay. Whenever the main image has a grass and sky background, it defaults back to old pictures. I, I tried changing the pictures in the upload photos section in the back end of Amazon Seller Central also. Nothing happens. So Josh, um, Tom's nodding, so we both have input here. I'll go ahead and share mine, and then I know Tom will probably just ping off of whatever I'm going to say. <laughs> so the thing with this is technically the grass and sky image is against Amazon terms of service technically. Now, the reason that you've been able to get away with it so long and why your competitors are able to get away with it is Amazon's pretty lenient on this rule whenever they know that it's going to lead to sales and conversion. And in this case, in your category, that sort of image had been leading to a lot of sales and conversion. Now, if I had to speculate about why Amazon suddenly seeing this as an issue, well, it could be a few different things. I know Amazon likes to do weird stuff around the beginning of the year. Um, so it could be that they have some bots just like trolling to for that white background. And that's why it's just reverting back instead of um, suppressing your listing. So that could be it. Um, Actually, I think that's like all I had in terms of a theory of why it's doing that. Yeah. What do you it's, got, Tom? It's something that Amazon dictates exactly yeah. like you said. So, Josh, typically you see this as being something that's extremely category dependent. Um, so it may have been back in the day that like 80% of your market on the first page was using um, <clears throat> was using like colored backgrounds or, or, or showing the grass, the sky, showing it like in the location. Faith, you want to share my screen real quick? I, yeah. I have the golf cart search uh, okay. pulled up. So uh, images like this, right? If mm. you were to look where you see this heavily common where Amazon really doesn't patrol this too much and dictate it too much is typically in something like, uh, uh, give me a, a sofa chair, like furniture is where I see. Oh yeah. Or like curtains or something like that where you can yeah, see where yeah. they're showing the product, like inside of a house, you see this extremely common in, in this type of category and Amazon typically, even though it's technically against TOS, Amazon typically allows this. Um, now it may be exactly like Faith said that, you're just having bots kind of come through and now mm -hmm. they're finally starting to hone in on that category. Again, there's millions and millions and millions of listings and thousands yeah. of different categories. Like their bots can't do it all at one time. So you might just be getting, I don't want to say caught for this, but they're using your previous image um, yeah. because they see that it might take up more space. Now, three recommendations we can give you to kind of maybe test getting around this. Maybe it's not a category dependent issue. Maybe it's not Amazon catching this. Sometimes Amazon, if your the product itself is not taking up most of the space in the image, they'll re resort, uh, revert, resort back to the previous image that you had. So maybe your tire is like smaller on the one with grass in the background, and maybe it takes up more more space or more real estate um, in that one versus the sky colored background, whatever one. Um, if you don't have that wrapped up, test that. The only other thing I can say here is test a full update or delete and relist. Maybe you can push that through kind of just by refreshing the back end of that that ASIN. That's kind of the only other thing. Unless, like you already mentioned, Faith, Amazon is just like, nah, we, we caught you here. We're not going to let you do this. You have to use a main image white background. Yeah, and it, and it could be uh, that as well, because now that I think about it, whenever we went over our theory that they let it happen because they're getting so many sales, well, if you're in like a seasonal category and it's kind of your slow season, that could also be why they're kind of forcing these changes. Like it's a bot. They're not taking seasonality into account. They're probably like, oh, let's go. We've got to go back to the old image. <laughs> yeah, I, I, It's definitely worth um, test. Look at your dimensions. Like Tom said, make sure that everything's up to par there and then try a full update. Push that through. Um, you'll need an image URL. You can't use Imgur anymore, unfortunately, but if you have those same images on like a Shopify site, for example, I think those links still work like the Shopify URL. Um, and then AWS apparently 
has a, like a free photo upload thing that you can use yeah. as well. So awesome. Very good. And then we got good question. Yeah, very good question. Then we got a donation from Andy H. Thank you so much for $4.99. Really appreciate you. And then he asks, I keep getting warnings about my product getting a customer complaint about once a month, and there's a risk the product could be suspended. I tick five boxes. I'll check my product, check my description. I think he's still typed in, but I know what you're saying. Um, you know, like you're, you continuously get, oh, here it, here it goes, et cetera. And then everything's fine until the next month. This has gone on for more than a year. How long will this go on for? Is this a thing with a lot of products? So the nature with Amazon um, customers specifically is they'll buy stuff and then they love to return stuff as well. Saw this whenever I worked at Amazon and I definitely see it now working with sellers. It's just the nature of the beast. But that being said, whenever people return stuff, there are people who know that they can game Amazon's system by saying things like, oh, product wasn't as described or I got the completely wrong product because using those reasoning codes will initiate a free return with Amazon. So all that to say, um, back to your original question, I keep getting customer complaints um, that, that there's something wrong with my product. There, It really could be that there's nothing wrong with your product um, and it's just people are returning it, putting in that reasoning code and Amazon just has to do their due diligence. What I would do here, if I were you, Andy, and I'll let Tom weigh in here as well, but what I would do, um, I'm sure it's not legitimate, but just make sure that it's not legitimate feedback, right? Like, if you're getting the same complaint, like, oh, this item arrived broken, like, and you got that complaint four times, then maybe, like, go into your warehouse, make sure that things are packaged properly, or if four different people are like, I ordered red and I got pink instead, then maybe make sure or check with Amazon, have them pull that inventory and make sure that it's actually what you would sit in. Yep. Pretty much. <laughs> um, the, the only, the only thing I can kind of add here is just keeping an eye on something like your NCX page or negative customer mm -hmm. experience. So like Andy, it, it, the only kind of light red flag that I have here is that this keeps happening, reoccurring, like you said, monthly on your specific product or your account. And typically Amazon starts to take further action when this keeps happening. Things like this keep happening. Mm -hmm. again. And I think that goes into his final question. Is my product inevitably going to be suspended? It could be. The, the sad truth is it, is it could yeah. be less these um, start getting resolved. So what I was trying to say is you can lightly kind of measure those metrics on your NCX page, your cu negative customer experience page, where you get that percentage and it looks at the amount of orders you've had versus amount of orders that are returned with customer feedback. And what's nice about that report in that page is it tells you exactly what customers yeah. are seeing. Maybe it's uh, clothing and they're not getting mm -hmm. the right size. Maybe right. it's uh, something like Faith mentioned, the product not being as descriptive, too large, too small, doesn't work, didn't charge, whatever the product mm -hmm. is, you'll get that feedback there. So it kind of gives you intel if there is a quality control type issue that you maybe have to sort out in the manufacturing stage with your product's life cycle. Um, but you're kind of going to be able to get that data and see what you need to do from that page. That's going to be the most helpful page there, negative Correct. customer experience. Correct. Yep. Very good. And then Andy did give us a heart. So I'm obligated to do the little gesture. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let's go back up here. Saw a couple more member questions. Brian said, thanks gang. You're welcome. And then Bill Edelman asks, hi, would I do better to set Google ads? So the clicks forward directly to my Amazon product page or clicks forward to our website, which contains a clickable link to our Amazon product page. So option one, because option two is just an extra click for people. Um, so that that's my take on that. Just real simple answer. It's going to be option one. <laughs> yeah, hundred um, yeah. percent. The digital and market uh, marketer in me. That's what I went to, to school for before I got into in, into Amazon. That's like basic one hundred and one. You, the less steps, the less actions you have to give the customer to make a decision, purchasing, buying. Mm -hmm. the more conversions, the more, more success right. you have through the, the funnel essentially. So going straight to, from Google ads to your Amazon web uh, page is going to go like loads better. I even typically recommend clients like 
you could roughly say like, oh, I'll just do my brand store so they can see all my different products. Well, you don't really want to do that because you want an ad that is specific to the product in terms of relevance and right. copy, what you're advertising and marketing the product and what you kind of want to hone in on in the copy. And you want customers going directly to that product detail page so they can make a uh, buy quickly, fast, with least amount of steps possible. Only other layer here we will add, Bill, is set up Amazon attribution so that you can. Oh, and that was actually his second question. How accurate is Amazon attribution as a measure of effect of using Google ads? Yeah. If customers click through our ads and go back to Amazon and order. Agree? Yeah. It, this is what kind of, I love Amazon attribution. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I've been doing Amazon e-commerce for five to six years. And since then, it has always been in a beta status. I think it still yeah. says beta to this day, doesn't it, Faith? Yeah, it does. Ridiculous. So it's it's not long it's as not beta. 100% up to snuff, so to, so to say, Bill. Yeah. Like we've seen issues where we know product level sales are increasing when we're tracking something uh, through Amazon attribution. And you can see things like... Uh, the the clicks and the the, the, the session, coming through, going but up. sometimes yeah. it just doesn't convert that sale and it really depends oh we're getting pretty technical here it really depends on <laughs> the cookie tracking dependent on what social media site you are pushing or what that initial platform whether it's google ads TikTok, facebook instagram whatever um sometimes amazon works well with things like google or facebook and sometimes like TikTok is a big one where Amazon has a hard time tracking that, even though you can set yeah. up on attribution. It's just kind of like a little known fact that it's not always 100% accurate, which sucks, but you always want to set it up the right way and, and whatever data yeah. you can get and get that 5, 5%, 15%, 10%, 10% brand referral bonus um, on conversions that come through off Amazon marketing initiatives. That's the whole main benefit of Amazon attribution. You might as well set it up and see if you can track it. Yeah, correct. And then just a tiny tidbit, tidbit of uh, Amazon insider knowledge, those cookies are supposed to last up to 36 hours. Mm -hmm. I think if I remember correctly, unless you clear your cash and cookies. So, which who does that? Not me. I mean, me. <laughs> I'll, do it like, I'll do it like once a month. Once every three months, whenever I like try to go somewhere and it's not loading right, I'm like, okay, it's got to be me. Got to clean. clean I want Big Brother to have all the data they could have on me. I'm going to leave the cookie. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like, please give me all these relevant ads. <laughs> Another member question from Touchstone. Brain Registry says we can't appeal a trademark rejection. We fixed our error. Is it better now to appeal or start a new application for the same trademark? So this is a good question. So yes. by trademark rejection, I assume you mean straight from USPTO, um, like when you're getting that trademark registered and the USPTO yeah. rejected it. If that's the case, yeah, Amazon can't do a darn thing. Yeah, so you're going to have to do a new application for that same yep. trademark. So if you know you fixed that uh, initial rejection issue, maybe it was too similar or too close to another word mark or, or whatever you're, you're trademarking um, that's already registered inside the USPTO. If you fix that, you're good to re reapply through the um, USPTO and you're good to submit brand registry again once you get in that pending status. You don't have to have that brand fully registered yeah. um, and fully approved on the USPTO side. You just need that pending status. Now, Granted, if you're going to have an issue, again, if it's pending and gets rejected, most likely Amazon, uh, with how they connect to the USPTO and have that data and information, they're going to uh, remove, cancel, revoke your brand registry privileges, most likely. Yeah. Oh, nothing to add there. Tom summed it up perfectly. Shout out to our trademark services. You can uh, go to myamazonguy.com. Any trademarks you need, we got the connections. Yes. Ali, do we have a banner for that? If so, let's uh, get that rolling for the trademark services. All right. And then Bill says, thanks for the advice. And then a uh, follow-up question. Look, we've got a good discussion going on here. Blaine says, going back to Bill's awesome question, I'm considering Pixel Me or the other company starting with A. I can't remember the name. Uh, would this report more accurately Google ads to Amazon attribution? Um, I, I'm thinking no, because it's just all going to be based off of that same cookie tracking. And then there's our trademark registration if you need it. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. 
or the other company starting with an A. <laughs> oh, I like that too. <laughs> I, uh, I really don't know the answer to that, just to be brutally honest. <laughs> You know, you, you get a guess from us on that one, Blaine. But that is a good question. Y'all are, y'all got us, I've got some good questions this year. Well, we got a new member, Arlene Mercado. Thank you for becoming a member. This is actually uh, one of my clients. So thank you, Arlene. I'm going to give you a little gesture if it'll work. And if it doesn't work in like the next two seconds, I'm just going to awkwardly put my hands down and uh, go to your question. Okay. Um, let's see. I did see it up here. Let me pull you up. All right, how can a customer access posts uh, besides store posts? Do you all know if Amazon is going to make posts more accessible to customers? So I have seen posts pop up um, on product detail pages. Looks like Tom's cooking over there, gonna get us an example. But to answer the second part of your question, you know if Amazon's gonna make it more accessible, I'm thinking that they're wanting to go that route, especially with them rolling out more features for posts such as the videos. Now, with all things Amazon, it's probably not going to be something that comes probably not even by the end of Q2 or Q3, but it, I would expect them to release another beta type feature to make posts more accessible, probably within the next few months or so, just because I can definitely see them try with this and like Amazon Live and some other social uh, marketing campaigns they're doing. I really think that they're trying to pivot more towards like this interactive model uh, to better humanize the products. Cause they're, I think they're trying to get away from like a, we just sell a bunch of Chinese junk. <laughs> so they're trying to give like a feature for the brands who don't just sell Chinese junk. So um, that, that was a good, very good question, Arlene. Thank you so much. All right. And then I think Tom, did you cook it? No, it? nothing, nothing cooked up uh, this. I was just trying to like look on a couple uh, PDPs mm -hmm. to see if I could find an example of it not being or excuse me, being somewhere other than mm -hmm. brand store posts uh, page, but I had no success there. Yeah, I've seen it. Let me, what's some stupid stuff I look up? Because I look up like cute curtain rods and stuff like that. And I always see it on like really girly stuff. I'm going to look for something real quick, Arlene, to see if I can find where I've been thinking I see it. Um, okay, now I see, so it's sponsored brands. I've seen posts like from there on sponsored brands, but on this page, I'm just seeing the shop. So um, it does show up on the PDP sometimes though. And I'll find an example and I'll send it to you on Slack. I don't know when that will be, but it, I'll, I will show you where that, <laughs> that shows up. All right, um, awesome. So we'll go back up to the top now and get some more questions. So let's see. I think uh, not really. Well, yeah, that was an important question from John Aspinall. Sweet hoodie. Where can I get one? <laughs> yeah, I know he's talking about my cardigan attack on Titan fit right now. So um, <laughs> actually, John, I got this shirt on Amazon. <laughs> um, and then. Um, yeah, that's, that's like you can also get the my Amazon guy hoodie on Amazon. I'm a big fan of our. Uh... We just had a new shirt. I wish I had it like right next to me, but it's upstairs. The us, the us versus us Amazon shirt. Amazon. It's yeah. so funny. Sometimes people think we are in with Amazon. We yeah. have that connection. Um, and the honest truth is we don't. We just have years and years and years of experience knowing the many facets, nuances of selling on Amazon. We... Uh, <laughs> I hate Amazon. <laughs> I am not a fan and, of and Amazon. I, I say that with the most, it's great for a business. It's great for having a new outlet or a new um, platform where you can grow your sales and grow your business and grow your brand. But the raise and fees, they make it so extremely hard for sellers, whether you wake up one day and see all of your product has been um, taken down for a, a stupid yank or suppression that doesn't even apply to you. Mm -hmm. Like it's just stuff we have to deal with and, and, solve every single day with the clients that we work with or you as a brand owner yourself selling on amazon if you've been in the game long enough you guys all know what we're talking about here yep. it's they don't make it easy this is why they really don't we thrive in helping sellers and brands like yourself to to get past this and navigate the, the many challenges amazon throws at sellers each and every single day 
So I guess in a way we do work for Amazon because if their support was not so god awful, then we would not have a career right now. So thanks, oh, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I did miss one from Gregor. Hey, Gregor. All right, he said I'm not doing that well in sponsored product campaigns, but I am doing good in sponsored brand and sponsored video. So I push harder on those. I know sponsored products should be 80% from ads, but in my case, it's about 80% sponsored brands. Is that good? Thanks. Well, it's not bad as long as you're getting the sale. And what it sounds like is happening here, Gregor, is people are more willing to convert whenever they actually see your product in action. So I would take that piece of information too and kind of run with it and really kind of drum up showing like that product in use. For your sponsored brand or your sponsored product campaigns, actually, if you're not utilizing premium A plus content, which has that video feature, that might be something you would want to look into. And I mean, don't after doing that, don't like pivot all your money into sponsored product campaigns. But I'd be curious to see how they perform if you had like more videos in general, which you might already and you might come back and be like, Faith, I'm already doing all this. They still <laughs> <laughs> but I would be curious to see how they would do if you had more like visual indicators on there, even outside of the video of how the product is yeah. used. Yeah, it's 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 like Faith said, it's really a good indicator that showing your product in market in use being used like is having more validity in the advertising space and real estate on Amazon. But man, Faith, that's really surprising to me. Like in my experience, this is very broad. Because it's the opposite like, it's, in my experience. Yeah, yeah, right. Like sponsored products should be where 60 to 80 percent of mm -hmm. your sales are coming from. Depending on what type of SP campaign you are running, it's typically one of your more profitable ones. The real estate for those big headline ads, full width, very top uh, of search headline ads uh, from sponsored brands or the real estate taken from the full width, the video module in the middle of the search results, sponsored brand video ads, that typically is more costly. Those CPCs can be higher because the real estate is bigger and it's more important and, 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 it, and it just has more competition. So those CPCs are higher. So right. it's odd to me, Gregor, um, just without knowing your product and your catalog, that you're not having that success in sponsored products. Like Faye said, it doesn't mean it's it's wrong or it's bad. You should capitalize and keep pushing on what's mm -hmm. working for you, your brand, and your advertising efforts. But something just sounds a little fishy to me there. That might There's be. a missing piece here. Yeah. And once we find that piece... We're gonna have a really good advertising puzzle, but we gotta find the piece. Yeah, <laughs> great question, oh, Gregor. Very good question. Gregor always has good questions. And then we got um, donation from Sandy Flow for four ninety nine. Thank you so much. I saw you had a few questions up here, Sandy. So I'll go up here to the top and read all of them so that we get you taken care of. All right, Sandy said, "Hi, I recently had two of my best selling listings taken over." How can someone do this is, and is Amazon aware of this flaw? And then I think you had some follow-ups. Okay, yeah. About my question, not wanting to sound sour, but it was a rough experience. and can't believe that something like this can happen. Yeah. Um, and then after many hours of seller help and tickets, we were able to gain back the listings. We were getting a letter in Chinese that was denying us from getting them back. Okay, that's weird. And then I think there's one more here if I don't miss you here. Um, Our brand Sandy. is registered with Amazon, by the way. Yeah, it's a little further down. Is there a way to avoid having your listing taken over? So outside of enrolling in transparency, which isn't even a guarantee because I do have clients who are enrolled in transparency and there's somehow sellers finding ways to still get on their listings. Um, Outside of that, unfortunately, there is not a surefire way to keep people off your listings. Like apparently, and Amazon is always boasting that this is one of the major benefits of brand registry. And yes, if you are brand registered, obviously you can report these sellers. But as you've seen, it's a process to get them off of your page. So it's a frustrating situation. But if you have any other advice on that, Tom, because I know it, it can yeah, be... It's Amazon is not yeah. in the business of policing your supply chain partners. And that may mm -hmm. sound a little broad, but what I'm trying to say here is like, yes, this should be the benefit of brand registry. You should own like your uh, Sandiflo. I would assume you're not like giving your products to other retailers and, and they could mm -hmm. resell. Your right. So what is, 
you're going to have more. What would be interesting to know here is like do a test buy because you might be able to um, see if it's actually like a, a counterfeit, right? Maybe they don't have a real channel where they can get it. And depending on what your product is, like you can sometimes have counterfeits uh, being hijackers all the time. Now, if that is the case and you do a test buy on your own listing when another seller has the the um the oh, buy shit, some further context they get their stuff in mexico what's that oh sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you she had some further con or they had some further context they get their stuff from mexico like sourced manufactured sourced probably uh no, no we import mexico. everything and send ourselves yeah yeah okay so that kind of makes me think that there might be a counterfeit issue oh there. yeah uh, and then in like, that case, yeah, you, you, you buy your own product, you see yeah. if it's a counterfeit and, um, you can report either, uh, this is where you can report on the customer side, which Amazon takes way more seriously, way more seriously than yes. you being a seller and, uh, opening a, uh, uh, like brand registry case or report abuse case. Like when you report from the customer side and you say that this is, um, not this product is different, you know? than I ordered. It's not what was shown on the listing. Um, Amazon typically will take high priority in that. And oh, yeah. They just take the seller down. Now, the other route you could go is you should. Um, oh, my gosh. I just had it and I drew a fat blank. <laughs> we talked about reporting abuse. We talked about um, counterfeits and. Oh my gosh, Faith, I'm blinking. There was like one more thing I had top of mind that I, I cooked full through. I okay. overcooked. <laughs> overcooked. Okay, we did test by counterfeit. You can put your brand name on your packaging, which you'll see a video from Steve mm -hmm. that, like, that helps prevent. Oh, this is what I was going to say. Have a lawyer send a cease and desist to that seller. So when you can, when that buyer is, excuse me, when that other seller is on your buy box, you can click the seller name and you're going to get like their address mm -hmm. information. And that's, especially when your brand registered, that's when you can go um, have a lawyer, like draft a scary written cease and desist letter and send that to the person. And that could get that person removed by their own willingness, you know, in, in fear of having legal repercussions thrown at them. Um, that is where you might have success there. Uh, that was yeah, the might being a keyword. I've seen some sellers who see these le these big scary legal letters, and they're like, okay. <laughs> so you know, I was I was talking to someone Faith in the last couple months, and they had an issue where the same thing was happening, and I'd never seen this before. The same thing was happening that uh, Sandy Flo is describing, and um like what a lot of sellers do, they were using the report abuse intellectual property um, violation uh, report or uh, case log that you can make. And they did that and they did that. And they, I guess Amazon deemed that they were abusing it. And they, mm -hmm. the I've seen page, that before too. On their account health also. page, they removed their report abuse um, section like they can't do that on their account anymore i had never seen or heard of that before i think i've seen it like one other time and it's a little frustrating because i guess there is typically or technically that clause in terms of service that if they think you're trying to sabotage another seller that they can start revoking stuff but i mean is that the other seller trying to sabotage you by hopping on your listing and impersonating your brand so i don't know um, yeah, and then Sandy said uh, the thief was in China. Yeah, so they're getting their stuff from Mexico. Thief is in China. Like, clearly a counterfeit issue here, and Amazon's still giving you down the road. Yeah, that's that's a tough situation, Sandy. But, yeah, I would send cease and desist, as Tom said. Do that test buy, but do it as a customer. So whenever you report it through Amazon customer service, they kind of freak out a little bit. All right. Very good questions. And then let me make sure I didn't miss anyone else. And we'll go back up to the top. Also, Sandy, I want to apologize to you because I noticed you were the very first question and I still kept missing you. So I'm so sorry, but thank you for being patient with us. It's first Friday of the year. So just get back into the swing of things. All right. Um, okay. 
I uh, sorry guys, just making sure because I'm being high D right now. Okay, we're good. Eddie's next. And if Eddie is not next, let me know if I missed you. All right, Eddie. Hi guys. Brand registry instantly rejected my application saying they couldn't verify my business details. I appealed with all the business documents and then they rejected again saying that the brand user has engaged in abusive conduct. I've appealed again for more info, but they are not replying. Any advice on how to tackle it, please? All right, so this one's pretty broad because there could be a number of things happening here. If you've ever had an Amazon account before uh, what you're doing here, they could be linking that account. Um, that's typically the most common reason why that this would pop up is that they have um, something going on here. Maybe from the customer side, if like there's some customer information that matches your business side and they think that you have submitted like bad reviews or something, um, maybe that's what where that's coming from. You know, it's funny. My sister is actually banned from reviewing stuff on Amazon. And to this day, she doesn't know why because she's not like left bad reviews. Anyway, that aside. I think you're doing what you can, you know, appealing, you're trying to get more information, but I would also check your email and make sure that there wasn't anything else that was sent there. Check your spam folder as well. Uh, Amazon does typically have, um, or they'll send out some sort of email and it should, it might be vague, but it should have some sort of reason there. Um, did you cook something, Tom? I have something. cooked. He is cooked. Ready to serve. Ready to serve. So, Faith, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and seriously, like, shut me down. I don't want to go into a long-winded yeah. explanation here if it doesn't make sense. Isn't this kind of the same verbiage that we were seeing when we saw the massive brand registry takedowns um, six to eight months ago? Yeah, no, actually, I think you're right, because um, I remember getting a lot of emails and stuff like, what did I do wrong? Is it because we're working with an agency? Like, is there... Yeah. yeah, what we had seen, we essentially, with a lot of sellers on Amazon saw this, Stephen Pope's own brand, Age of Sage saw this, um, a lot of clients we work with saw this. If they were using outside, I believe the the catalyst was outside the US, like attorneys, uh, to register their trademark, Amazon did a massive sweep and flagged those attorneys, which nullified the brand registry and removed it. And that all stems, I pulled up a random trademark here, just looking at our uh, good buddy Nike here. Um, one way around this that we had kind of figured out and we were able to replicate this and our SOP and our process on this is like way more in depth than this. I don't know all the exact steps, but what you need to do like logging in or, or signing into the USPTO, um, you need to remove your attorney of record. So mm -hmm. if that attorney of record removed, and again, Eddie, this is only assuming this is like the same issue that we saw when a lot of brands yeah. had their brand registry removed due to attorneys who filed it being blacklisted by Amazon is what that catalyst was. Now, if that's an issue with your attorney, maybe they're outside the US, third party, whatever Amazon deems is the issue, you could technically have that attorney of record removed uh, resupply or reapply for the brand registry. And you, we've seen in a lot of cases that we were able to get through and re-register um, our brands or our clients' brands that way. That is all I have cooked. Dinner is served. Dinner, dinner is served. Delicious. All right. And then John Milton, I do see your question. Let me get a couple of others because I saw your original question as well, but there are a couple of people ahead of you. Let me get them and then I promise you're next, King. All right. So let's go back up here. Yeah, Nathan, and then Eddie had one more and you're next, John, I promise. All right, Nathan said, I have a branded product that I've been selling for five years on Amazon, but my trademark attorney said I won't be able to get a trademark because it's too close to another brand name. Can I change it on Amazon? So yes, you can change your um, brand name on Amazon. I actually have a video on that. Um, now, I am gonna go ahead and preface though before I link the video. The video is pretty short because I go over like the way Amazon's supposed to make it easy to do, but most likely you're probably going to have to file a case and work with Amazon a little bit to get that brand name change. And what that's, what that's going to look like is you're going to need um, a picture of the brand name on the packaging. And it's going to have to be like baked into the packaging. You used to be able to like tape like the brand name on there um, and get by with it. We 
me and Jason had like this example that we would show all the time on the podcast, but irrelevant now. So it has to be like baked into the packaging, send that and be like, yeah, this is a new brand name. This is product, please change. So that's in a nutshell going to have to be what you're going to do to change that brand name. If that's what you're asking. Yep. 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 Awesome. And then I just actually ask answers the second question a little bit as well, Eddie. It's a brand new company with new account, new trademark, never sold anything. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, that's from the other one. Brand user. Okay. Yeah. Th this makes me think it's more yeah. this makes me think it's more in line with what I kind of outlined and showed. Maybe an issue with the attorney who filed mm -hmm. the USPTO submission itself, aside from Amazon. Um, other than that, Eddie, you kind of just gotta I know you the first rejection of your application saying they couldn't verify the business details maybe there's still an issue there but um kind of double check what i outlined with the attorney of record you can have them removed and that doesn't affect your trademark in any yeah. way shape or form but it might allow you to kind of get through the brand registry procedures and get um verified there correct and then tushar said how to change brand name um so i'll go ahead we're ali if you want to find that video and post it in the chat and then um we'll go from there and now let's get John. Hi, I've been having issues with my UPC codes. I was selling my products like normal, but right now I'm having issues with the UPC codes at Amazon and I don't know what to do. And then I saw you. Okay, so that's just the same one. All right, so what we found when this happens is Amazon's looking for a G10 registered UPC code. So back in the day in like 2015, 2016, a lot of sellers were just getting third-party UPC codes off of uh, eBay, uh, some other marketplaces. It was completely a legitimate thing to do um, at the time. But now Amazon's kind of cracking down on those and they want G10, which is where your brand name is registered. And then those UPC codes are tied to that brand name. It's essentially an extra step for them to uh, prove the legitimacy of your product. Um, so with that forward being said, what you need to do is First, if you do have G10 UPC codes and like you didn't get the third party UPC codes, then just disregard everything I've said. Um, <laughs> it, it could be that, you know, like you just need to send Amazon your G10 certificate. Um, and then from there, they should fix it. Um, I was going to say something else as well in terms of UPC. OK, yeah. If you are, however, in the third party UPC code boat, um, what you're going to want to do there is relist the product with a G10 UPC code, you can merge them later. So don't worry. I know like the main concern here is losing out on all those reviews and indexing and all that listing history, but you are able to merge those after the fact. But point of my answer here, and I know I've been pretty long winded, is you are going to need a G10 UPC or a G10 registered UPC code. Tom has cooked. Not much. I just love this graphic that we have in our SOP kind of outlining the flow chart for this. Exactly <laughs> like you said, um, yeah. ASIN old UPC, make a new listing with the GS1 um, G10 certified UPC. And then you go through the merge process and there's a couple different outcomes that can happen. But what you're looking for is that through the merge, Amazon allows the listing to have the new UPC code in your reviews and your sales velocity and your stock and your inventory, like mm -hmm. all of it stays aggregated under that new ASIN, well, technically old ASIN, but with the new UPC code, the new GS1 certified UPC code. And that is how you, they're not easy. They can actually be pretty long winded and require cases with Amazon. The hardest thing that sellers have to navigate when they are going through a merge of two different ASINs, two different UPCs, is that every darned backend detail has to be matching the same. And if Amazon sees that you're missing a period and a bullet point compared to the other listing, or you have one other field that's different, mm -hmm. um, they're going to say, hey, these aren't the same products. You need to make sure all details in the backend are matching the other ASIN to successfully complete this merge. And even trying to use the tool that Amazon gives you to merge them doesn't typically work and you might need to go through cases, but high level, broadly, this is the process that needs to happen to take. Correct. Care. And I do want to address something because somebody came through here and said, or file for G10 exemption. Now this is not going to work in this case. So you can absolutely do that. And then going forward, you're going to be set, but this is not going to work in this case because there's already a UPC tied to that listing and we need to get that fixed before we can move forward with that. So yep. All right. Now, 
let's see. I see that this question had a supposed to be a five parter, but I'm only going to get the first part or we're only getting the first part here. So Muhammad, if you have the second parts and then you can post them real quick. I know we're got about 20 minutes left here. I still think we can finish up, but I am going to start kind of honing it in just to make sure that we get everything. Hi, Amazon guy. I really need help. I'm a British citizen. I've tried to open an Amazon account a few years back and then left it halfway through the validation process. Recently, I decided to proceed with, I'm going to assume creating it, and I'm going to assume there's some sort of issue with the verification, but please let us know in the comments because um, we didn't get uh, parts two through five of that. And then um, let's see. All right, Simon, I'm seeing promotions on some of my products in the buy box area. Buy two or more, save 15% discount by Amazon. Is that something we control or who pays the discount? Um, so the discount by Amazon is supposed to be an Amazon funded discount. Like the key there is discount by Amazon. That's how you know, like you didn't accidentally set it up or your VA or the agency you work with didn't set it up. That's an Amazon discount. Just something they're doing. They do yep. it from time to time. And it's, it's nice because it's, it's a free promotion for you because it's not coming out of your pocket. All right. And then Andy asks, does a creator creation or creator connection success depend on the product? Uh, if you're selling a great product as opposed to selling a plastic bucket? Yeah, absolutely. Think of it this way. If you're an influencer and someone's offering you a plastic bucket or gold bucket, which one are you going to take? Yeah, exactly. You want something that has that uh, viral ability, so to speak. Not that it's necessarily viral or going to go viral, but you get more success when someone can show that product that is unique, cool, like in use uh, th through a video um, is, is really where the most success comes from in my experience there. One cool thing I never mentioned with Creator Connections is for one of our clients, we were actually able to get um, BuzzFeed as a oh. uh, influencer. Um, That's major. <laughs> That is major. It sounded so major, but I don't think anything actually came through with it or at least measured inside the back end of the creator connection. So maybe it, it was just really give it time. Like, oh, darn, this is like a really, really big publication platform place where like, right. you get this product shown. There could be a lot of cool traffic from that utilizing creator connections, but it whether they never ended up posting after accepting the creator connection program that we set up, who knows? Um, yeah, depends on the product. It really does. Uh, uh, there's no secret sauce there. I, I don't know how to like say these products work or these products don't, but the bucket example is probably the best. You're not going to have an influencer selling your, uh, <laughs> like promoting your bucket to make sales increase through creator connections. It's hard to say. Correct. All right. And then Tana V says, Hi guys, is Amazon Transparency Program very helpful to fight bad guys? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, no, yeah, no. I mean, it can be, but I just, in my opinion, I'm a transparency hater. Actually, um, I think, I think the idea is good. Don't get me wrong. They had the best intentions in their heart when they launched this program, but I've just seen it be a hassle for a lot of sellers who are in it, um, and. I'm, I know specifically at least one seller I worked with who was enrolled in this program and still has issues with people because what it does is, yes, it can help people not jump onto your listings. But for this seller in particular, there were still counterfeits under different ASINs. So like it doesn't really help with that because it's trying to pull it from a UPC perspective. So if somebody tried to go through on like a G10 exemption or like a. Um, they got another UPC or something, then it's not going to register to that ASIN and you're still going to have the counterfeit problem. So pros and cons, honestly, it's like lesser of two evils. Like if you're getting a, if it's like an egregious problem, then yeah, enroll in transparency. But if it's something that happens like twice a year, then I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, I do want to piggyback off of that because I am a transparency proponent. <laughs> oh, so we're going to get two Slightly. perspectives. Where it makes sense. Let's think of the pros and cons here, Faith, and kind of outline yeah. the trend. So I'll give them the cons. Tom's going to give you the pros. <laughs> well, so what it does is it allows what, what's what's going to happen here is you enroll in the transparency program. Amazon gives you a unique transparency code ID, QR code type thing that you 
now have to sticker on each and every single product that is going to Amazon. There is a slight per unit fee for that. Um, it's minimal, but it's something that needs to be taken into account when you are uh, he heavily focused on profitability and your cogs like per unit. So it is an additional fee. It's also an additional step in your um, manufacturing shipping process, your logistical process, so to speak, right? Because now it's a separate sticker. You still got to have your F and SKU or your UPC. Mm -hmm. Now it's a separate sticker, an additional sticker that needs to be added on to your products. Now, what this does is any unit that is shipped out from an Amazon fulfillment center has to have that transparency ID. And you are the only one that will have that. No other reseller will have that transparency ID. So if they already have stock, let's say they have the buy box, Amazon, think about this through like the, the logistical workflow, customer buys, Amazon pulls out a unit, they ship it down the line and it's gonna scan that transparency code. And if it's not there, they remove that and they do the next seller in line, which ideally if you face this issue a ton will be you, right? So now you're getting that sale that you would have normally lost because you have a bunch of resellers on your specific ACE and your specific listing. So there's a separate cost. There's um, the added logistical process in it. But I've seen this. And the reason I'm a proponent here is uh, I had an account under one of my brand managers, Faith, that was facing this week after week mm -hmm. after week. And we were going through the pros and cons. Is it worth it? Should we do it? Does transparency even work? And we did it and we set it up and it really has resolved the issue. Oh, okay. Sellers so, uh, on, their, on their listing. So it doesn't work for everyone. I gave you an example of it working and then I gave you an example of it not working. And, and to, to warrant your your uh, view on this, um, your opinion on this, I've seen it not work as well. Like it's, yeah. it's weird. The other cool thing that it says on the transparency help page, if you were to search transparency program, mm -hmm. amazon.com, brand registry, whatever, and you go to the uh, Amazon like help page on this. Supposedly, it's supposed to lock or stop anyone who already has your product listed, and they have to supply that transparency right. ID that only you have. So it should, in theory, stop those should. people who already have your product listed in their Seller Central account because now they're locked in and have to put in this ID that they don't have and can't find without reaching out to you. Correct. And the same is supposed to be true of FBM shipments as well, because I know that those aren't being sent to Amazon. But in theory, anyone who lists an FBM or like fulfilled by merchant under that ASIN has to prove to Amazon in some way, like they have to take a picture of the code and send it to them. In theory, I haven't seen it work that well on FBM though. <laughs> yeah, th that's where I just think the the being locked out of that ASIN in your Seller Central account kind of comes into play. Assuming yes. that's what really happened, it's weird because I've never seen that on any client accounts I've worked with because most of our clients are brand registered; they own their product. Correct. Um, and I've never seen someone else like force us to have a transparency code because we own the product. So I've never seen that kind of come through from any of the work I've done in Amazon. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting here, and this goes back to a few other conversations, I believe it was like Eddie um, or another um, seller on here who was talking about the counterfeits and the hijackers, and we didn't even get into transparency program too much. It's weird, gang, because the thing that throws me for a loop is like, this is what brand registry is supposed to solve. Because exactly. You're adding a product and you put in Nike as the brand name and you're about to list a Nike product. There's going to be an error that comes up and it's going to say you need authority and a letter of authorization from the brand to be able to sell this product. Um, please supply this and we can't make your product or make your listing until you do this. So what throws me for a loop, Faith, and there's there's no answer for this. It's just mm -hmm. uh, a good conversation. How are people getting around on listing these damned brand registered products on their seller central account without or they forge an LOA? Like, I don't know. How do they do that? Well, I'll tell you how <laughs> I, I did it at an old company. Oh, wait. Really okay, bad. let's hear it. Um, funnily enough, we actually just bought like UPCs off eBay, which makes like the G10 issues that come up like further salt in the wound, right? Because yeah. like we'll attack like sellers who, yeah, they're legitimate. They just didn't have a G10 UPC. Meanwhile, like other sellers can just throw in a random UPC and it's like, here's a new ASIN and just you know, list that product. So that's how we were able to do it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Or if they have a G10 exemption, but yeah, we didn't, but yeah. Interesting oh. stuff. I know. 
Um, I, I'm not, I mean, I haven't worked for that company in like three, I mean, obviously, because I've been here for the last three years. So I'm, I've been genuinely curious on like how they've gotten by on like the brand name stuff that they sell. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No idea. Interesting. All right. And then next question, we've just got a couple more. Uh, we did really good today and then we'll, we'll be out here at one thirty. CB, we changed entity for our accounts, mostly okay. The new company name appears on storefront and most other places except for the name at the top of Seller Central next to country. Any idea how to change it? Yeah, so that's actually under settings global accounts instead of like your business information and stuff like that. And it's just your Seller Central display name, right? Um, no, so there is, I know what you're talking about, like in the back end, whenever you go to like, account information or business information will say seller central display name. So they've already changed it there, but it's still showing like different. I actually dealt with this with a client recently, which is why I knew this like off the top of my head, but to change like that full name, like, you know, like the drop down name for whenever you log into seller central, uh, you would have to go to settings and then global accounts. Oh yeah. That's Honestly, I think where it says, display name should be where you change your display. Yeah, I, I'm looking at Agus Sage's back end on account info and I thought it was just on that top right where it says welcome Agus Sage, click edit your seller yeah. profile. Yeah, because we had done that for this client and I'm like, well, what's the hang up? Literally same exact situation and was playing around and it's, you know, settings, global accounts. And you can only see those, those global accounts if you're the main admin email, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I learned something new today. Thank you, Faith. You're welcome. All right. And then I think we have one last question here from YouTube is fun. I'm assuming that's what the YT means. What should I do if I have a really high A cost on my PPC campaigns over 150%? If I keep stopping them, then I won't have any sponsored product campaigns. Yeah. So um, actually, this is a really good question to end out with because this is something that we can dive into for a few minutes, you know, just very broadly without having looked at the campaigns. So whenever I look at a campaign with high A costs, I also look at some more granular details as well. Like, well, am I actually getting orders off of this campaign? What type of campaign is it? Is it an auto campaign? Is it an exact campaign? Is it a broad match campaign, et cetera? So Based off of those, we can branch off into a lot of uh, different answers here. So uh, Tom's got some something cooking here. So I have. So. It's just, uh, yeah. I just want to go through. A, we have the time. So we, there's yeah, no other time. time. We're, we're, we're set. Okay. So it's, uh, duh, 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 duh. there's like so many, uh, they make the advertising console fun to look at, easy to look at, but where the data you need really is is it's tucked away right and there's a couple mm -hmm. different ways you can easily filter this now if you're not an excel spreadsheet guru type person where you're going to download an excel sheet and manipulate the data to kind of get the data you want to make an informed decision on what you should keep not keep targeting wise some easy like the, if you're seeing an a cost of 150 percent the the thing i first do when i get into an account that i'm newly onboarding is I'm going to remove any filters. I'm going to look at spending greater than zero. And I'm going to look at orders equals zero. So what's this going to show us? This is going to show us where spend we're spending without any return. Spend that is happening on our date range without any sales, meaning they're just inefficient campaigns, right? They're not working. Um, and you could add that layer of active. So you remove these inactive campaigns, mm -hmm. but what we're going to see here is uh, not to throw any, uh, shade at the, the age of sage account here. But what we see here is $1,300 that has been spent in the last 30 days and not accruing the sale. So what's interesting here is you're not going to see a, uh, let me make sure I have our little. Okay, we have a cost here. You're not going to see an A cost on this, but when you look at your overall A costs, uh, when you remove these filters, it's sure as hell going to affect that because you are having all this spending, yep. not having sales come through. Now, this isn't alarming if you look at a filter like this and you just made some campaigns on December 8th. It's early. It's only been 30 days. Maybe we need to fine tune some uh, some bids or reevaluate the targets we chose. 
but when I, where I get concerned when I see this is when I, um, yeah, especially these campaigns just made like this makes sense. You need campaigns like this time to, to, to mature mm -hmm. in the market and test. And especially the, the type I was seeing some broad, some phrase yep. discovery match type campaigns to see what was going to work. And I'm going to filter by highest spend here. And luckily it looks like we just recently turned these off based on, uh, based on our analysis and, and the ads check-in that the team did on age of sage. Um, but we had a campaign that had spent $35. It had gotten 37 clicks in all of the targets inside of this uh, sponsored product keyword campaign. Looks like it's only one target here, so it's not going to be too crazy. But the target in here, which randomly Halo Santo holder, whatever that is, point is, is that this didn't accrue any sales and it had enough time to be tested and it didn't work. You cut that out immediately. You rinse and repeat. You try something new, right? So you always want to be refreshing your ad targets. You want to do a check like this bi-weekly just to really see if the things you have set up and you thought may work uh, might work based on the SQP report, based on Helium 10, all these cool keywords. You you did your research and you want to test them. If it doesn't work, you go back to the drawing board and you, you try again. What should be happening through this rinse and repeat process is you would have found keywords that are working and those are resulting in decent or good a cost. You keep those, you remove the ones that are just wasteful spending and you go back to the drawing board and find new targets, or you just remove those and you really hone in your bids and your strategy on the keywords that are working and converting for you. So there's like so many different ways to chop this up. Yep. Something you should do like literally every week, every other week, just to really maintain good efficiency inside of your ads console. Um, the only other thing I can say is like download your search terms report. I was really only looking at a campaign level. So what's cool about the same filter, if I go to all campaigns is you can do the same thing at a targeting level, just looking at the data, right? So instead of looking at campaigns, let's look at targets, which mm -hmm. is all the targets that are happening tucked inside of the campaigns, right? And if this loads, I would do the same filters. And what you're going to see here is at a targeting level, what keywords just aren't working and having wasteful spend. And those differ depending on the campaigns, right? So campaigns just show you full campaigns that aren't getting sales with spending happening, but these are specific targets that would be under that same filter. Other than that, you can do the same manipulation when you download those search term reports um, in the reporting console on the ads side, but that's like the easiest thing to look at. And if you want more information, more details on like Oh, well, how should I adjust my bids? Like this is very general, basic, mm -hmm. up wasted spend. Obviously the strategy goes way more in depth when you're- Yeah, especially depending on your product type, yeah. cost per click, your budget, your personal KPIs, et cetera, profit margins. But just overall, that's a very good way to kind of hone in and remove some of those bleeders and cut out some of that wasted ad spend, pivot it towards targets that are actually working. Yep. All right. And then I did see Margo come through. Hey, Margo, happy new year. Are you guys still streaming? Something's wrong with my internet. I'm sorry. We are about to wrap up, but um, we'll be here next week, obviously, here every Friday at noon. And then this is a good segue, um, I guess, into our little outro here. We are my Amazon guy and girl. Um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, my Amazon girl. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll cook and share my screen for once, but um, our website, our website, my name is on guy.com. Um, we offer full service account management, but we also offer PPC only, or if you only have like a one-off issue, if you need trademarks, I know we mentioned that earlier in the show, um, we do account audits, but if you need like some one-offs, we also have some a la carte services as well for like troubleshooting, like A plus, et cetera. Um, if you wanted um, just a one-off coaching session, um, get some, get a little bit more. I uh, mean, just me, <laughs> just just more me. Now Tom, Tom's too popular. We had to take him off the page. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you want to talk to me, Kristen, Jason, or John, um, we are here to answer your questions. Um, Jason's premium pricing. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Oh, he he's also, worth it. He's worth it. He is absolutely worth it. Yeah. Like you're going to, you're going to get a lot of good content out of Jason out of that session. But um, we also have our SOP library uh, for sale. I wrote a lot of these. Tom's contributed here as well. 
a pretty good deal if you're looking to kind of do your own thing but not sure like kind of what the best process for something is um thousand bucks pretty good deal in my opinion and then finally we do have our mag school courses um everything from seo to ppc we've got our bundle course and we are hiring as well um so if you wanted to see what it's like to work with us, want to try your hand at brand management, or maybe you're a PPC specialist, want to do some PPC stuff, just go to myamazonguy.com slash jobs and we'll see what we got. Love it. Awesome. Love it. Awesome. Happy Good show Friday. today. Yes, yeah, happy Friday. Friday. Great first show Friday. <laughs> and yeah, well, we'll see you next week and uh, have a good weekend. Thanks, gang. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.